Good morning. Let's get ready for Sunday school. Now, as we've been continuing our series through Bible inspiration, preservation, and translation, last week we looked a little bit at the particular translations and uh, moving toward the King James Bible. If you would, in your Bible, go to Proverbs chapter 30. Go to Proverbs chapter 30. Today we're going to look, we've looked at inspiration, which is where God breathed his word and gave it. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Then we looked at preservation, how God has absolutely kept his word over the ages through different languages, which is amazing how many different copies there are in different languages that actually line up. They align perfectly. God has perfectly preserved his word. Then we began to talk about translation. And this morning we're going to talk about corruption. There is a corruption out there. There really is a conspiracy to change God's holy word. A lot of people have heard of it, but they don't entirely understand the extent of it. And what I'd like to look at this morning are the two biggest culprits. Now, we've looked at the Latin Vulgate, the problems with that, and the different Hebrew. But today we're going to look at two Greek manuscripts that are in question and oftentimes are referred as both the oldest and the best manuscripts. And I'm going to prove to you that they are neither oldest nor are they the best. If I could get a couple young men to help me. I, I threatened the old men. I said, I don't have any young men this morning. I'm going to get the older guys, the elders, to come help. So they were willing, but good to have you guys with us this morning. Thank you, young men. Make sure everybody gets a copy of that. We're going to talk about Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, which are four of what's called the Great Unseals. This is a common, they say there's four main Bibles they focus on. We're going to look at two of them because they are the main two. They're the two in question, the infection of the corruption. And unsealed just simply means all capital letters, no spacing. It is very difficult to read. You literally, there's so many letters per line. It doesn't matter how many words are there, where you left off or where you go. So in all reality, it would be, it would be very difficult to read. If there were no spaces, everything was capitalized. There's no punctuation um, and just imagine how difficult that could be to try to determine where one word ends and the next one begins. So it is something that they had to pour over slowly and delicately, and it wasn't something that was meant to be read, which is really the beauty of the King James Bible. It was meant to be read. It was forging that English language, the mother tongue. It was uh, solidifying certain words that we continue to use today and certain phrases. There are numerous phrases that come specifically out of the King James Bible. And so we're talking about the infection, this corruption, the conspiracy to change God's word. So on your sheet there, you'll notice in 1844, Codex Sinaiticus was discovered by Constantine von Tischendorf, a German evolutionist theologian. Being German, he was part of the higher criticism. They doubted the scriptures. He did not believe we had the word of God. And he said, it's probably lost. And so I'm going to start searching for copies. And he was famous for finding copies that had been erased and rewritten. He was famous for finding documents that had been erased and written over. That's where he began his fame. Uh, he was a German evolutionist theologian in a monastery at the root of Mount Sinai, is where, at the foot of Mount Sinai, is where they found the Codex Sinaiticus. He claims that he found 43 pages of Old Testament leather parchments in a trash basket being used by monks to start fires. However, he contradicts his own story elsewhere. He has a book where he, that's his claim. He, they were 120 some leaves, and uh, he was able to take a third of them. They were throwing them away. They claimed that what was in the basket had been gone through twice, and they decided they were going to burn it. I, I used some terminology very specifically, leather parchments. A vellum is a form of leather. A parchment is leather. I put leather just to help your understanding. Paper burns. Leather smells. Okay? The process of making leather, imagine... Imagine if we had to make paper, if we did this project and we're going to go get some trees and then we're going to cut down the bark and we're going to get the shavings and we're going to make paper. That would be a difficult process and paper only lasts so long. Well, leather, they prepared it in such a manner 
where they continuously scraped it and bleached it and they continued to prepare it. Now, what's interesting is what he started with were bleached white. What he gets later is a totally different color. Cyanaticus has a lot of problems. It just doesn't match up in many ways. But it wouldn't make sense back then when you could recycle leather and rewrite over it, which he was known for doing, why you would burn it. So his story doesn't match up. And even in his own account, his own book, on the next page or two, he actually begins to contradict himself in the story. And it turns out these baskets were used for storing the leaves. And well, I thought you said it was a trash basket. This is commonly, you will commonly hear this, that this is the account that he found it in a trash heap that was being burnt and thrown into the fire. The only truth in it is that that's what he said and claimed. The monks have a different story. And perhaps it's true that they were giving them away and he ended up with 43 leaves, 43 pages of that Old Testament leather parchment that he claims are in a trash basket being used by monks to start fires. However, he contradicts his own story. The next sentence here, there is a substantial evidence that he was lying about the circumstances of the textual discovery. Now, in Proverbs 30, if you will, I had asked you to turn there earlier, Proverbs chapter 30. When you get there, look at verse number 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. I believe that's something that Constantine von Tischendorf is guilty of, is adding to God's word. He's been found out as a thief and a liar in, in modern history as he contradicted his own story. Continuing there on your sheet, if you'll notice, it says in 1859, he returned and purchased a Greek New Testament written entirely in capital letters, also made of calfskin. It is missing 12 entire books. Additionally, parts of six more books and many crucial verses relating to the resurrection. Go to Mark chapter 1. Go to Mark chapter 1. Let me give you an example of a couple of his omissions or of Sinaiticus, the omissions in it. So now this so-called oldest Bible has a lot of problems. It's missing 12 entire books and missing halves or major parts of six more books. There are many crucial verses relating to the resurrection that are completely missing. In Mark 1, first of all, look at verse number 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. God. Sinaiticus said, a son. Many of the new Bibles delete that completely. It doesn't say the son of God. Most of the modern Bibles completely eliminate the term totally because, well, there's a contradiction. This is in question. Therefore, we'll completely omit the phrase. Go to Luke chapter 24. Go to Luke chapter 24. The translators of the critical texts, namely Westcott and Horton, we'll deal with them next week. Their rules are really bizarre and illogical in many ways, but when they find contradictions, they get to decide what they want to keep, what they want to throw out, and thereby giving us a very strange, eclectic text today, um, all the modern versions. Um, one of the major themes that's missing in Sinaiticus, parts of John 7 through 8, where it talks about the woman caught in adultery, the entire story is just completely omitted. It's completely missing. You're in Luke 24, go to the end, and in verse 51, this verse is completely missing. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Well, now, wait a minute. That's kind of a big verse. That's kind of an important doctrine. There are many things about the Lord Jesus Christ, his full, his complete signature that are deleted and missing. It'll just call him Jesus instead of both calling him Lord and Christ, taking away from his deity and anointed uh, Christhood, the Messiah. If you will, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 1 rather, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to continue reading. Now, by the way, the Vatican has had a history of forgery, and so has the Orthodox Church when it comes to certain texts that contradict a total history of deception. Uh, continuing on the next paragraph there. There are numerous 
unscriptural editions such as the apocryphal books, Isedris, Tobit, Judith, Maccabees, Wisdom, Ecclesiasticus, plus two heretical writings, the Episcopal, Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas. The apocryphal Epistle of Barnabas is filled with heresies and fanciful allegorizing, claiming, for example, that Abraham knew Greek and baptism is necessary for salvation. Some of the statements in these two books are so bizarre that even the Catholics won't put it in their modern Bibles in the Apocrypha. Those two books, in a sense, will really date Sinaiticus to prove that it's outside of the realm of the time where they try to claim it's from the 300s. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse number 17. This is a good verse to have memorized. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now, wait a minute. Does baptism save us? The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ according to 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4. That's what we believe. That's what we're saved by believing that Jesus, as God, came down, died for our sins. He laid down his life as a payment for all of my sins. And he is resurrected, thereby giving us victory over the grave. Baptism is a picture. We're given the great commission that we should go and baptize after they're saved. There are many groups that believe baptism washes away their sins. And this verse totally debunks it. It's very important. On that paragraph we're reading, that last sentence, it says, The Shepherd of Hermas is a Gnostic writing denying many basic fundamentals. Gnostics were known for, Gnostic means knowledge. That's what the G in Freemasonry is. It's the worship of knowledge. We have an ascended knowledge, the hidden knowledge, the esoteric teachings. We know the secrets of all ages, and we can do magic, many of them would teach. And we know the truth about Jesus. He's not what Christians believe. The Gnostics were outright pagan and heretic, and they brought a lot of doctrines into churches over time by slowly perverting the Scriptures. Go to Hebrews chapter 1, if you will. Turn to Hebrews chapter number 1. I'm going to continue on that next paragraph there. Codex Sinaiticus changes the order of the Gospels. It's the only Bible ever found that does this. It changes the order that the Gospels are written. It changes the order of the Gospels, teaching Jesus was only a man. It removes the bodily resurrection. It removes the heavenly ascension and adds adoptionism, which is teaching that Jesus became the Son of God at his baptism. This is a big problem in Pentecostal oneness where they say Jesus became God when he was baptized. He was just a man. He didn't rise from the dead. This is called adoptionism. It's an early heresy. You're in Hebrews chapter 1. Look at verse number 8. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. God the Father said to God the Son, Your throne is forever. God is forever. He said to the Son, Your God and your forever. There are many more verses that support that, but Hebrews 1.8 is a fantastic verse that debunks a lot of the misconceptions from the early heresies. Continuing in the next paragraph on your handout there, Sinaiticus is filled with alterations of an obviously correctional character brought in by at least 10 different revisers. And this number comes from many of the uh, paleographic scholars over the ages that have looked at it. They understand writing and literature and paper and volume, the leathers. They understand all this stuff. And many of them have identified seven. Others have identified at least ten different authors that have modified or corrected Codex Vaticanus over different ages, different inks at different times with different dates. Up to ten revisers. It is plain that this codex bears upon its face the most incontestable proof of its corrupt and deceptive character. On many occasions, 10, 20, 30, 40 words are dropped through very carelessness. 
The impurity of Codex Sinaiticus is recognized in every part of it. Some textual experts date the alterations and deletions to be from a 7th century reviser. Others have set forth a date of fabrication in 1839 and see it as completely fraudulent. That seems to be among the textual, um, not the critics, the, the, the um, textual receptus crowd, the uh, traditional text, when they compare it to all the other things, the things that are going on with it, they see that not only has it changed over the ages, it has different sheets of paper, different color, different color inks, different handwriting styles, things that are clearly erased. And they say, well, this is the oldest Bible, and therefore it's the best. I often use this understanding. This Bible, I've had it for about 20 years, and I had to recover it. I used to call it my loose leaf edition. I would open it up, and, you know, a, a book would fall out. And, oh, hold on, let me grab that. And I loved it so much, and it's a super giant print, so I can see it from real far away. And so I, I sent off, and I had it recovered. And it was a good investment because I love this Bible. I have other Bibles sitting on my shelf that are practically brand new and yet way older than this because it's a false Bible version that I don't use. The age of Sinaiticus is debated. It's the oldest. It's from 325. We think Constantine himself um, had it. You know, he, he's the one that chartered it. Can't be proven through history. It has many problems just in the fabric and the makeup and the language, the writing, the style, the additions of books that couldn't have existed back then. There are many problems with it. But every mainstream Bible... When you go to the bottom, certain passages, like where they take out 1 John 5, 7, Luke 4, 4, certain things they take out, you go to the bottom, and it says some of the older manuscripts or, or other manuscripts have it, or they'll say the best manuscripts don't have it. And what they do, they'll word it differently ways, but they're trying to cause doubt to the Word of God. Some Bibles completely remove it. Others will put it in brackets and then put a, a you know, well, hey, by the way, that shouldn't be there. We don't think it belongs there. And that's what happens with Mark 16. Go to Mark 16, if you would. Go to Mark chapter 16. Mark was the book that in Sinaiticus they put first. They put it first before Matthew. And yet there are many things missing in it, especially the tail end of it, the account of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, his ascension, the Great Commission. These are the things that are under attack. The resurrection account of Jesus is clearly omitted in Mark 16, 9 through 20. If you notice in verse 9, it says, Now when Jesus was risen early, the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devil, devils. And he went and told them that he had been with him as they mourned and wept. Of course, the story goes on as he continues to teach them and tell them. And he tell, gives them instruction, but this is missing from Catholic dogma. They love Mark, but they have a different Mark than we have. They don't read Matthew as much. On the back side of your sheet, in 1843, Codex Vaticanus was made available to Tischendorf. Now, if you, if you notice, it was 1844 that he discovered Sinaiticus. The year before, he's at the Vatican. Does anybody know what Vatican means? It means hill of divination. It's like a mountain of magic. No, not, not Disney World. <laughs> a hill of divination where they divine up spirits and bring up other spirits. That's literally what Vatican means. In 1843, Codex Vaticanus was made available to Tischendorf for six hours under supervision, and he copied a few verses from the Codex. It was said to be first cataloged by the Vatican Library and 1475, and what they do is they would write down a list, occasionally saying they have this book, they have that book. There's an, a debatable history about Codex Vaticanus. Again, they want to claim, oh, it's super old, it's from the 300s. Well, what's your proof? Well, here's a, here's a piece of paper from the 1400s listing everything, and right here it says, Book of the Vatican. Well, what's the Book of the Vatican? Well, that's this copy of the Bible. Even that is very questionable. There's a questionable history. There was of it being stolen and returned. Is it the same book? I'm a skeptic. Continue reading. 
It was said to be first cataloged by the Vatican Library in 1475. In 1866, Tischendorf was granted greater access to Vaticanus. His work in copying was transferred to Westcott and Hort, who immediately incorporated it into the development of their New Greek Testament. We'll be talking about Westcott and Hort next week. So Tischendorf was the bridge to get Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, at least in part, into the hands of the world. Sinaiticus has, has never, to my knowledge, as it is, been together. You can now look at pictures of it online, but it's chopped up into four different sections all around the world. You can't just like reprint it. Here, give me a copy of it. There's one out there, but it's not truly a copy of that. It's just a, it's a, it's a fabrication of it itself anyway. So the book doesn't stand alone. It's not like we say, well, here's the book right here. No, it's pieces and parts and sections that are around the world that they're calling of the same Codex and Sinaiticus. Vaticanus is a copy, a complete copy, although it's missing Genesis 1 through 46 and Psalm 106 through 138. Um, there are intentional omissions, and it's not fragmented. It's not like it's falling apart like an old Bible. It's a complete piece. Continue in the next paragraph there. It says, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus are the basis for most modern Bible translations today. However, these two manuscripts differ substantially from the text of the bulk of the manuscripts, your traditional line, the 5,000 plus copies. These two codices contradict each other over 3,000 times in the Gospels alone. Can you imagine having these two Bibles side by side? And you see, this is different. This is drastically different. They've added words. They've taken out words. I thought they, they claim it came from the same batch of Bibles from Constantine, but it just does not add up. Just in the Gospels, it leaves out words and whole clauses about 1,500 times. It bears traces of careless transcription on every page and is lacking First and Second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, a third of Hebrews, and all of Revelation. In the Old Testament, the order of books are altered and eight apocryphal books are added. Why would they take out the pastoral epistles? Well, because they believe in the Catholic priesthood. Why would they take out Hebrews 9? I believe it starts at verse 14 on. Well, because they, again, believe in a Catholic priesthood. They don't believe in the priesthood of the believer. Uh, the, when you look at the sacrifices that are talked about in Hebrews 9, 10, 11, it's quick to debunk the mass. If you read that, you say, well, wait a minute, how can they keep a mass? Or why are they having a priesthood? This makes no sense. Every believer is a priest. Why did they take out Revelation? Because they don't believe in a literal return of the Lord Jesus Christ. They believe that he's on the seat of the amillennial, postmillennial views that have come from the Catholic Church. There is no literal millennium. That's just a, a big number where the Catholic Church reigns and the Pope is in charge instead of Christ right now. They've changed everything and calls people to doubt it. So they, completely, so they can say, well, Revelation doesn't even belong in your Bible. And you say, well, why do people say things like that? Because there's one copy that's missing a lot of things. And there's also a lot of other things added in. Those apocryphal books are full of strange doctrine, heresy, abuse. There's some weird things in those. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved. Well, that's not found in the Catholic Bible. Not only was it not found in Codex Vaticanus, but if you go to any Catholic Bible today where it says, for you to study to show yourself approved, they manipulate it to make it sound like you need to bring good works. Instead of saying, why don't you get in the Bible and prove it for yourself? They say, no, 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 they don't believe that. You need to go to them to understand what it means. According to the Westminster Dictionary of the Bible, it should be noted that there is no prominent biblical manuscripts in which there occur such gross cases of misspelling, faulty grammar, and omissions as in Codex Vaticanus. And these are the better? They're not older. They're not better. Vaticanus omits Mark 16, 9 through 20 also, but a blank space is left for that section of Scripture. It appears as if somebody has erased it right out of the page. The entire manuscript has been mutilated. Every letter has been run over with a pen, making exact identification of many of the characters impossible. It's called rewritten. Somebody took it and rewrote over every letter. That's bizarre. Similar to Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus identifies itself as a product of Gnostic corruption. In John 1.18, where the only begotten Son 
is changed to the only begotten God. Do you see how that's... Do you think Jesus Christ is a created being or do you believe what the Bible says that He is the Creator? Because those verses are under attack in every major Bible. Linguistic scholars have observed that Codex Vaticanus is reminiscent of classical and Platonic Greek, not Koine Greek of the New Testament. All of the biblical omissions in the new versions reference, reference, so your new Bible, you go by one today, will reference the older and best manuscripts. However, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus are neither older nor better. I give you a list down there at the bottom to help you understand some terminology. The corrupted Bibles use the Alexandria. What we have in the King James uses the Antioch. It's also called the critical text because it criticizes the traditional text. It's called the minority text because there's only a few compared to the 5,300 copies of the majority. It came, it's an Egyptian text versus our... Uh, there's a Byzantine text that's identical to the Syriac, the Peshitta, the Old Latin, the Gothic, all the other translations that we have, commonly called the Textus Receptus or the TR, meaning the received text. I like the word traditional text. I have a traditional Bible. It's the same that it's always been. They don't. They have a new Bible that is critical of what God has already given us. I end there with Jeremiah 23. For ye have perverted the words of the living God. I do thank God that we have a perfect copy. And as many fake versions as they print today, they can't change mine and they can't change what I've memorized. However, when somebody walks into a bookstore and they say, well, I need a Bible. Well, the Bibles are over there. Can you imagine going over there? Oh, a Bible, Acts chapter 8, verse 36, verse 38. Excuse me, sir, this Bible's missing a verse. You might want to return it back to the printer. This has a problem. You might want to check the rest of them. If that verse is missing, that means this thing's no good. Somebody made a major mistake here. Oh, no, no, no. The well-educated scholars that are tied to the Catholic Church, they've decided we don't need that verse. There really is a conspiracy to change God's Word. There is corruption. We're saved by the incorruptible Word of God. There is a corruptible Word of God that perverts salvation and changes it and tries to turn grace into works. And I thank God, hey, we can trust Him and His Word. Every Word of God is pure. He's preserved His words, and we can have great faith and what he's given us. So I hope that's a blessing to you. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much. I pray that you would help us to continue to learn more about you and your word and have confidence in you. We love you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You are